Okay, so let's move on. Um, so 34. Which particle model diagram represents a chemical change? So we have to understand there are two types of change. Chemical change means chemically something is going to be different. So if I were to take water and turn it into hydrogen and oxygen, that is a chemical change. A physical change is taking something like water as a liquid and turning it into, let's say, a gas. Okay, so it's a physical change. You're changing the state in which it, what you'll notice is I start with water and I end with water. Here I start with water and I end up with something completely different. Okay, so end up with two absolutely new things, right? So with that in mind, let's take a look at what we've got. And let's go from there. So in this case, it looks like we have, well, just this one white sphere. And it looks like it's in a gaseous state. And now it's in a solid state. Okay, so it's compressed or it's, yeah, it, but it's, it hasn't changed chemically. It's still just those individual white spheres. Here, it looks like we have the other way around. I have a solid and now I have a gas. So both of these can be eliminated from the chemical change point of view. Um, here I have a compound, and here I also have the same compound. In fact, nothing really happened here. Uh, they're all the same, so it's gaseous state too, so it didn't even go through a physical change. So I can eliminate that. Let's double check uh, this next one, and it looks like this next one is, uh, looks like it is the correct answer. In fact, it looks like it's almost the exact thing that I have, only it's balanced. Um, I have... two blacks and one white. So I have a compound made of two blacks and a white, and it's turned into two black two, and so let's go two of these, and plus W2. So it has completely changed chemically. This is the answer, D. Compared to the physical and chemical properties of the compound NO2 and the compound N2O, okay. How are they the similar? Well, they both have nitrogen and they both have oxygen. But we, the problem with this is they're not the same chemical. So they might have similar, similar chemical properties. They might have similar, uh, similar interactions, but there's no way to know because they're completely different. This has this compound it's completely different than this compound. Although they're similar in terms of they only have three molecules, nitrogen and oxygen, uh, or three, I'm sorry, elements, three atoms each, um, there are different ratios. And with that in mind, there is no way we're gonna know. They might have similar, but overall, they're gonna be different chem physical properties and different chemical properties. They're gonna boil differently, they're gonna react differently. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So. Um, although they look similar, they are not. They have to be pretty much the exact same thing to have same physical chemical uh, properties. All right. Elements with a stable valence electron configuration are found in. Okay, so let's talk, talk about what a valence shell is. So if I were to take something like sodium, sodium is, sodium is in group one. It has one valence electron. Is it stable? Well, you don't really run into a whole lot of sodium metal, right? In fact, we have to keep it in oil because it's unstable. So we have a choice. Sodium can either, our goal for this is to lose all of the electrons, which gets us to a stable core set of electrons, gets us back to that noble gas core, or we can add until we get to eight. So if I were to lose them all to go to zero, so if I were to lose one because it's got the one valence electron sodium becomes na plus if i were to gain seven it would be na seven minus because it's gained negative charge so which is it going to do we anticipate again this side here is going to go to zero so we lose all of the valence electrons this one is going to add until we get to eight. 
which one is more stable? Well, it's the one that actually does less. Okay, it's the one that actually, so sodium is going to be stable, but the sodium, this, the original version of it, just sodium with one valence electron is not stable. So that is not going to be stable. Group eight, that's in the still not stable, although it has eight valence electrons, um, not necessarily stable. Uh, because this is in the middle of the D block and generally it's gonna become positive or negative. Group 11, not so much. It's gonna have uh, a handful of valence electrons. Group 18, group 18 is the noble gases. This is what makes something stable. So sodium, not stable. The only stable state is, or stable in their elemental form is gonna be group 18. All right, let's see. Uh, strontium and barium. Um, so let's find those on the periodic table. Um, they have similar chemical properties. So let's talk about this idea of similar chemical properties. This only happens when we have the same number of valence electrons period. The electrons are what are going to determine the properties of these things. So strontium and barium have similar chemical properties because they have this, they, uh, because they have the same number of protons. They definitely don't. They're different elements. They have different number of protons. Neutrons. Nope. That, not that either. Electron shell. Um, no. And in fact, they don't have the same electron shells. Uh, and these are the inner electrons. They have nothing to do with reactivity, ultimately. The only thing that does is the valence electrons. Both of these are in group two. So they each have two valence electrons. If they both have two valence electrons, they like to form a two plus charge. Strontium two plus, barium two plus. They react similarly because they be like to become the same ions. All right. Which of the following orbital is not possible? Okay, so generally when we run into this question, there are certain limits, okay? So there are certain limits to which orbitals are possible. So let's break it down into the three, the four different blocks that we have on the periodic table. So it's, without going back up above, we know that there are three blocks on the periodic table. There is the, this is not drawn to scale. No, it's going to take forever. There we go. Uh, yeah, this is definitely not going to be drawn to scale, but there we go. All right. Oh. I'm going to suffer through my drawing. There we go. That is going to be our S block. The next section is going to be the other portion of the main group known as the P block. Okay, I'll make it a little bit more. It's more of a, there we go. The P block, okay. In between the P block and the S block is the D block. And below all of them, actually in between the S and the P, but we see it below, is the F block. The first S block, the one up here, is the 1S, okay? Because it's the first block. The first P is the 2P. The first D is the 3D. And the first F is the 4F. 1s, 2p, 3d. What that means is the 1p does not exist. The 2d, the 1d, they do not exist. The 3f, 2f, 1f, none of those exist, right? So these are the limit. That's the start of the blocks. So what we're looking for is, do we have something that is not allowed? And so anything before 
anything that I've crossed out here is impossible to have. So a 2P, yeah, it is possible to have 2P. It's the first one, 7S. Start with one and there can be any number of S blocks you want. The 3F, right there, there's the answer. The first F block is the 4F. That's all we're allowed. And the 5D, yeah, we have a 3D, we can have down to a 5, uh, 5D for sure. So we're limited with the first, again, as we go through the blocks, S, P, D, F, 1S, 2P, 3D, 4F, based on when the blocks appear, okay? So that's it. All right, moving on. Consider the element with the electron configuration, okay? So let's take this electron configuration. Let's go back to our periodic table. Let's take a look. Uh, 5S, 4D. Well, first of all, it's in the D block. We have to get 10 electrons. In fact, we don't even need to go above. All right, so 5s, that means that if we take a look at our s, there's our d, there's our p, so s, p, or d, sorry, d, and the p block. Um, we have gone through the s, and we've traveled through the d. Remember, the last one in the d block has d10, okay? And so we are stuck here. We are stuck somewhere here which essentially puts us right in the middle of the transition metals. So a representative is element is a representative element. No, non-metals, non-metals are gonna be up in this region. That's not where we are. Noble gases, noble gases are all the way in, at the end here. And it's definitely not that. So that brings us back to where we knew we were. Transition metals, right in the middle of the transition metals. We could take a look at uh, at the periodic table and go four, uh, seven D electrons in, but you're going to find out that you're going to end up in the transition metals. It's more of the fact that we end in the D shell, and the D shell means we end in the D shell. If this were, I don't know, four P or five P rather, five P two, we'd end up somewhere in the P that would, you know, might be. Uh, metalloid or uh, a non-metal, but you definitely know where you're going to end up. All right. Which of these two electron configurations have represent elements that would have similar chemical properties? Again, similar chemical properties. Um, if we're looking for similar chemical properties, they have to have similar, uh, they have to have the same electron configuration. And so here's the focus. What we want to do is we want to ignore everything but the outermost shell. And we do that by looking at the highest integer number. So in one, two is the highest number. So I'm going to highlight everything with a two in front of it. For three, four is the highest number out front. And let's highlight everything with a four in front of it. Uh, two, oh, again, it's the two. And for four here, we're going to highlight everything with a four in front of it. And so now we're just going to ignore writing the number uh, and just write. So instead, we're just going to ignore the two in this case. We're going to ignore the four in this case. Ignore this two, ignore this four. And now let's look what we've got left. So this first one is S2P4. Three is S2P3. I don't really care about the D electrons. Okay because it's a full shell, so we kind of ignore it. Uh, the next one's S2P5. We don't have any similar ones yet. The last one is S2P4. So S2P4, S2P4, four and one are the same. So four and one answer is C. Again, we're looking for things that are in the same group ultimately, and they should be in the same group. And they are in the same group. So things in the same group, uh, this is in group six or group 16. Group 16, okay? All right. How many electrons are in the 4P sublevel of bromine? Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna get the electron configuration for bromine. So we're gonna go to the periodic table and then we're gonna come back down and look at bromine. So 4P of bromine, or yeah, I saw this before, so we'll do it again. All right, so, our target is bromine, all right? And we're always gonna start with the uh, noble gas configuration for bromine. Uh, so bromine, the line before 
the line before bromine. There we go. Here's bromine. The line before it is argon. So we're going to start with a. So we're going to make bromine. Bracket argon means we start at argon. Means we can just move to the outermost shell. So I'm going to fill the 4s first. After the 4s is going to be the 3d. After the 3d, we're going to fill up the 4p. Okay. So 4s2, the entire s is going to, because we got to go right to bromine. 3d10, 4p5. So there we go. That is the that is the end result for bromine of the simplified electron configuration. So let's take it back down to the question. Let's see if we can get it right. All right, so here's our answer. How many electrons in the 4P sublevel? There are five. Five electrons in the 4P sublevel. All right. How many electrons are in the 6p orbital of bismuth? So same thing, let's find bismuth um, and figure out how many electrons we have. The answer should be B for this one. So you should see three for business. bismuth. How many valence electrons for antimony? Okay, so take a look at antimony, see if you can come up with it. Um, and I'll let you go because you can actually see that. Well, yeah, I'll let you take a look at that. All right, moving on. Which statement describes the general trends of electronegativity atomic radius uh, in the periodic in the that are in period two? Okay, so before we do this, I'm just going to use the space up here and let's just talk about the general trends or periodic trends. So what I really want to do is I'm going to talk about a handful of things. Um, First, let's talk about electronegativity. Electronegativity is the ability to draw electrons in. The thing that is most electronegative on the periodic table is fluorine, highest electronegativity. We don't really ever look at the noble gases, but we're going to say highest electronegativity. We always go to the di other diagonal. Fluorine is in the upper right of the periodic table. So if we actually travel down to the other corner of the periodic table where you find cesium and francium, this is going to be the lowest electronegativity. Okay, so if we know one side, if we know one corner is the highest of anything or the lowest or the biggest or the smallest, we know the other corner is the opposite. Okay, so fluorine has the highest electronegativity. There's trend one. Uh, let's talk about, um, let's use helium. And all we need to do is memorize these or know these for helium. Helium is the smallest atom, uh, smallest atom on the periodic table, smallest size. So the atomic radius, so maybe I'll just say that, smallest atomic radius. So what does that mean? Well, that means that cesium has the largest atomic radius again down and to the left helium is also going to be uh, have the highest ionization energy well if helium has the highest ionization energy cesium has the Low, uh, the lowest ionization energy. It's really easy to get rid of an electron for, uh, for cesium, okay? Uh, so we get the idea here. If we understand that helium is the smallest, it has the highest ionization energy, fluorine is the uh, most electronegative, that will help guide us for the, through the rest of this. So with that in mind, okay, which statement is about general trends of electronegativity and the atomic radius? Okay, so fluorine is the highest, as I said. Cesium is the lowest. High electronegativity. Okay, perfect. So both electronegativity and atomic radius increase. 
Um, oh, we are looking, by the way, we are looking in the order from left to right in period two. So we're in the second row going from left to right on the periodic table. So if we're going from left to right, we sh because fluorine is the highest, we're going towards fluorine and therefore we're following the trend. We're climbing. We should see an increase in radius. So anywhere we see a both a decrease electronegativity decrease so we can eliminate those right off the bat so it's one of the next two one of a or c okay so that's take care that takes care of electronegativity now we need to think about atomic radius so i said fluorine was the smallest or i'm sorry helium was the smallest small and therefore cesium is large but going from left to right again we're going towards helium. So we're, make, we're getting smaller as we get towards helium, as we go towards from left to right. And the trend is always gonna follow the same trend, right? If you're going towards the smallest atom, you're getting smaller, whether you're traveling up or you're traveling across. So going from left to right towards helium, we see a decrease in atomic radius. So that eliminates A, leaves behind C. Okay, next up. Which of the atoms has the strongest attraction for electrons in a chemical bond? Strongest attraction, this is describing electronegativity. Which one wants to pull those electrons in? So if fluorine is in a bond with some element, some other element, the electrons are really close to fluorine and we get this like negative region as they pile up. So let's take a look at what we've got. So here's fluorine. That's the highest, that would be the, the, the strongest attractor of electrons. We know chlorine is below it. Uh, we have oxygen, then nitrogen, then carbon. We have sulfur here and phosphorus here. So if we take a look at the ones that we're looking at, chlorine, sulfur, phosphorus, carbon. Out of those two, which one is closest to fluorine? Chlorine is. Chlorine is right below fluorine. Out of this group, it has the highest, it's the closest it can possibly be. So chlorine wins. Um, if it were between chlorine and oxygen, oxygen is not an option here. Oxygen has a higher going left. You see a smaller decrease than going down, but chlorine is the closest thing, so it wins. Which of the following statements is incorrect? The atomic radius, okay. So radius, again, helium is small. Uh, this corner also has high, elec high electronegativity and high ionization energy. High ionization energy. There we go. All right. Let's over a little bit. So that means we see the opposite, we're going down. So the following statements are true. The atomic radius decrease from left to right. So are we going from left to right? Are we approaching helium? We are, so that's true. We do see atomic radius decrease moving from left to right on any period. The metallic character increases. Well, helium is a metal or is, is a non-metal, right? We know that metals are on the left. So going from left to right, this one is actually incorrect, right? That one's not true. So that's not true. That is true. Uh, ionization energy increases from left to right. Right, it's got the high, highest ionization energy. So moving closer to fluorine makes that true. Uh, the atomic radius decreases down the periodic table, increases down the periodic table. Yeah, helium's the smallest. Therefore, when you go down, we see an increase in size. So therefore, this is true, making it an incorrect answer. So the answer is B. Which of these elements has the highest ionization energy? Again, helium has the highest ionization energy. So closest one to helium is going to uh, essentially have the highest ionization energy. And these are actually all in the same group. So carbon, silicon, germanium, and tin. Carbon is gonna have the highest ionization energy because it's highest on the list. Carbon it is. Which of the following has the greatest metallic character? Again, helium 
is least metallic. I guess that's the other thing. Cesium is most metallic. So that being true, if you look at the periodic table, which one is the closest uh, to, and I believe that is going to be, yep, C, barium, right? That one's the closest to cesium. Again, if you know the trend, if you know, understand helium, then you can just, the other corner is the opposite. All right, moving on. Which of the following has the largest radius? Again, helium is smallest. Cesium is largest. So the trend being, as we go down, we see an increase in size. As we go from left or from right to left, we see an increase in size. Uh, so rubidium is lower left. Rubidium's down here. Uh, it's actually in group one. I think it's just above cesium, if I remember correctly. Rubidium, bromine is over here. Molybdenum is the middle of the periodic table. Iodine is here. Which one has the largest size? Well, one that's closest to cesium. So rubidium. Yeah. Again, just following the trends if you know helium. Among alkali metals, group one, potassium reacts more rapidly than lithium. Why? Okay. So we have lithium, sodium, potassium. Again, you can see this in your periodic table. Uh, which one is the most reactive? Well, it turns out size has a lot to do with it, but let's just eliminate what we can. Potassium has more electrons. Um, is, is it reactive because it has more electrons? Remember, the only thing that makes it reactive is the number of valence electrons. They have the same number of valence electrons. So we can eliminate that. Potassium has more neutrons. Yeah, it does. But again, I told you the number of valence electrons is what tells you the reactivity. The valence electrons of potassium is at the greater average distance. Yes, this is true. So this is lithium. There's the electron. This is the potassium nuclei. The electron is much further away. Because it's much further away, they're not close to each other. And because they're not close to each other, really easy for that thing to leave. And then finally, we have to have electrons. And the electron, the only thing that matters in terms of reactivity is the valence electron. So ignoring, so whenever you're doing one of these reactivity problems, just ask yourself, is it talking about valence electrons? The only one that talks about valence electrons is C. And that's the answer. All right. In the formula, XCl2. X could represent the element. All right, let's just briefly talk about this. Um, whenever you have something, we're going to come back to this in just a second. So when I have some chemical, okay, so let's do a hard one. Fe2O3. I have a couple of regions. Remember up here, I'm going to have the individual charges. Down below, I'm going to have the charges for the entirety of the atom. So that's iron as a total. So both irons together. This is all three oxygens. What's the total charge? So which of these do we know? I know oxygen is negative two. The whole thing is neutral because there's no charge down here. So I'm going to say the whole thing is neutral. So because it's got a negative two charge and there are three of them, that gives me a total charge of negative six. What has to go in the empty parentheses to make this true? Well, a plus six, right? So the plus six minus six equals zero. Well, the plus six in the two gives me what's charge? As in plus six divided by two, because it has to be divided up, gives me a value of plus three. So I know the iron has to be plus three. So what we know is if we know one of them, and it's generally the halogens, chlorine, bromine, iodine, fluorine, or oxygen, which is always negative two, or hydrogen. So there's a handful of different things we know. So in this case, same idea, XCl2. X is some chemical or some element. We don't know. The whole thing is neutral. This is the charge of the chlorine, the two chlorines. This is the charge of X. 
I know chlorine is minus one because it's in group 17, right? Group 17 and how I got there quickly, group 17 means it has seven valence electrons. So as a choice, so chlorine has a choice. It is going to lose seven or it's going to gain one. Losing seven or gain one, which is easier to do, gaining one becomes Cl minus. That's how I know that it forms a negative charge. So with that said, I have negative one charge times two. So two of them give me a total of minus two. So here I have to have a charge of plus two. There's only one of them. So because that's true, that charge is going to hold true. Plus two. X has got to be a plus two charge. So that leaves us with a bunch of them. Aluminum is in group three. Easier to gain, lose three or to gain five. Easier to lose three. And here's where I'm going to say, if I lose three, it becomes three plus. Aluminum is three plus. Always remember, I'm positive. I lost an electron. If you remember that, you will always get this right. I'm positive I lost an electron. Aluminum is going to be positive three. Argon. Argon is in group 18. So it actually has, it's good. It doesn't need to gain, got eight electrons. Lose zero or lose eight or gain zero. It's good. Magnesium in group two. Lose two or gain six going to lose two. I'm positive I lost an electron. This becomes plus two. Sodium, group one. Lose one or gain seven. It's going to lose one. It's going to become plus one. The only thing that's plus two is magnesium. All right. What is the chemical formula for lead four oxide? Okay. So we've got lead. I've got oxygen. The IDE means that there's not a polyatomic. It's just oxygen. Do we know the charge for either of these? Well, actually, I know lead because this four tells me the charge. Whenever you have a Roman numeral, just write it. That's the charge. That's the charge. That's the charge. How about oxygen? Oxygen's in group six. Do you want to lose six to get to zero? Or do you want to gain six or gain two to get to eight? Six plus two gives you eight. We're going to gain two because that's easier to do. So two minus. So this is the, the compound I'm going to make. Lead 4 plus O2 minus. Then there's a couple of ways that we can do this. But the way that we should do it is I'm going to take the number from lead and the number from oxygen, and I'm going to give it to the other one. So I'm going to take the 4, and I'm going to give myself 4 oxygens, and I'm going to give myself 2 leads. But when we create a compound, remember those numbers become subscripts. So PB2O4. Can it be simplified? Yes, this one can both be divided by two. So one lead, two oxygens. There's my structure, PBO2. Which pair of elements would most likely form an ionic compound? All right, ionic compound, really important. A metal is what we're looking for. Do we have a metal? We must have a metal in order to make a ionic compound. The other part of it is a non-metal. But most importantly, we have to have a metal first. So if we don't have a metal, we don't have an ionic compound. So let's go through the list. Phosphorus is a non-metal. You're going to find in the upper right. Bromine, also a non-metal. So that eliminates A. B, zinc, that's a metal. Good. And we also have a second metal. So two metals that would form a metallic bond or an amalgam or something. We don't really, can't do that, anything with that. Next up, fluorine. This is a non-metal. Aluminum, this is a metal. So this is good. So I think that's the answer. Let's take a look. Carbon, non-metal. Sulfur, non-metal. Good. We can't use that. C is the answer to that one. All right, what is the formula for calcium phosphate? Well, we're given phosphate, great, PO4, three minus. It's really important that this is phosphate, PO4. Every single time you write phosphate, you write all of that. We'll remove the parentheses if we only have one, but we don't know yet. 
and calcium, group two, lose two or gain six. It's going to lose two. I'm positive I lost an electron. Lose two. Again, I'm going to take the number, two phosphates, three calciums. So remember, they become subscripts, Ca3. Keep that in parentheses, PO4, two. I would get rid of the parentheses if there's only one. Like this one has only one, right? And so we got rid of the parentheses. Uh, CA3, get rid of those two. PO2, so get rid of that. The answer is B. All right, good. So that's good for now. The rest coming in the next video.